those elite performers and coaches out there. Hope you enjoy. Awesome, Nancy. Thanks so much for taking the time out to join us today. How are you doing? Excellent, Mark. Thanks for having me. No problem. Well, uh, I'm excited to jump into this topic today because caffeine and specifically coffee are two massively popular subjects with uh, with clients and readers, and, and you're an expert in this area. So can we just start off generally with a bit of information around, you know, you know, is coffee good for us? What are some of the benefits that the average person would get from drinking coffee? Well, I think you're bang on that coffee is a very popular topic, and uh, it's in the research or in the news probably almost daily. Uh, in the research, perhaps weekly, and it is the most widely consumed psychoactive substance in the world. So about 90% of the adult population are consuming caffeine regularly. So as far as uh, the relationship to health, we do see a lot of studies that show that there are health benefits. And so some of these, um, of course, are related to heart health. Uh, We have the lowered risk of diabetes. We have Uh, a relationship to perhaps lowered risk of certain cancers, such as liver cancer. Uh, We have kidney health, Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's. So certainly there's a lot of diseases out there that caffeine seems to be implicated in a positive way, Uh, but certainly there's more research that needs to be done. And when we don't find consistency in research, we sort of want to see what, what else can we be missing? And of course, that's my area I'm excited about, is looking at genetic variation and how that applies to this research and can help us tease out the details and understand who might have a health benefit and perhaps who might have a health risk when consuming caffeine or coffee. Awesome. And as we jump into this, um, you know, with the metabolism of caffeine, I know is is a big part of this whole uh, genetic question with regards to, to caffeine. Um, so whether it's cognitive function or physical performance or whatnot, can you can you walk us through the, the general metabolism of caffeine, and then perhaps we can take that dive down into the genetics and, and and figure out how it impacts us. Sure. Yeah. Well, caffeine is metabolized or broken down in the liver uh, by the CYP1A2 enzyme, which is part of the P450 uh, enzyme family. And the, this enzyme, the CYP1A2, is encoded by the CYP1A2 um, uh, gene. So the activity of this enzyme is influenced by this gene and therefore your genetic variation in this gene. So most of us uh, will have one of three forms of this gene. And depending what form you have, that's going to determine how you respond to caffeine, whether it's uh, in regard to diabetes risk or heart attack risk, or now, of course, uh, we're looking into athletic performance. And as far as uh, slow and fast metabolizers, the time frame looks like it's about maybe four to six hours for a fast metabolizer. And for a slow metabolizer, I think this can be more like eight to 10 hours. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to feel stimulated for 10 hours. It just means that it's still in your body. And this is an important uh, concept because a lot of people feel that they're very fast metabolizers of caffeine because they can have a cup of coffee and go to sleep. But that's not the case because you can still, uh, perhaps that caffeine is leaving your brain quickly and so you're not stimulated and therefore you can sleep. But that caffeine is still circulating in your body for many hours and perhaps having a negative impact uh, to your cardiovascular system, for example. So you don't know if you're a fast or slow metabolizer unless you do the genetic testing. So you can't feel how quickly you metabolize is, is what the point is there. That's that's a really, really important point. I'll tell you, I get so many patients and even athletes who you know, almost braggadociously are saying, you know, I can have a, a double... Um, espresso before bed and absolutely no problem falling asleep. And and like you mentioned, they're kind of using that as proof that they are a fast metabolizer. Whereas, you know, what you're saying is they could just be habituated to caffeine and, and they really need to get, uh, we really need to know, you know, with the, with the genes, what's going on, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and also uh, the, the sleeping component is due to the stimulation. And so caffeine is, 
uh, an adenosine receptor antagonist. That's how caffeine's working in the brain, where it's blocking your calming effect of adenosine, and it's giving you that stimulation effect. And that is what is making you unable to sleep. And so therefore, that's only uh, one uh, component of your body that caffeine is affecting. So the ability to sleep or not is one aspect, but then we have a whole cascade of other things that caffeine is doing in your body unrelated to sleep. And so that's where, you know, these, with regard to performance or health, those are things that we have to dive into a little more deeply when it comes to the research. It's, it's not a matter of, is caffeine giving you a buzz or not? Can you sleep or not? Uh, there's, there's more to that story that we need to investigate. And then on the genetic side of things, can you walk us through, um, you know, what are my odds of being a slow versus fast metabolizer? If you can give everyone just back to that high school science class yeah. again, it would be great. Well, I think maybe we'll uh, back up a little bit and just start with the field of nutrigenomics and, and what is this about and, and what does it mean, this genetic variation? Uh, so I think as far as uh, diet overall, it's long been recognized that the, the one-size-fits-all model of dietary advice uh, is based uh, on an average response of the population. And this might not be relevant to certain individuals. So, for example, we see something like lactose intolerance, where even though we have recommendations to consume two or three servings of dairy a day, that doesn't work for everybody. And perhaps um, probably my best example is where the U.S. and Canada dietary guidelines, for example, tell everyone to lower their sodium intake. But we know that uh, sodium will, in fact, help lower blood pressure and therefore your risk of cardiovascular disease uh, if you are salt sensitive. But genetically, about 30% of the population will have no effect on their blood pressure by lowering sodium intake. And we can actually have adverse effects. So some people actually should not be lowering their sodium intake, even though our dietary guidelines toward the population say we should do so. So that's where we really have to look at the needs of the individual. And uh, of course, we see this with caffeine as well, where uh, about 50% of the population can safely consume uh, up to four cups a day and have no increased risk uh, of heart attack or high blood pressure. And they actually uh, receive some health benefits. It looks like having more than one cup a day in this in 50 percent of the population will provide you with some of these health benefits and perhaps that's due to polyphenols and other antioxidants contained in coffee but the other 50 percent of the population uh if they consume more than about two cups or let's say uh, uh, a tall uh, Starbucks coffee, if they consume more than that per day, uh, they do have a higher risk of blood pressure and heart attack. And this research was was done in our lab about a decade ago at, at the University of Toronto. And uh, so it really is important when, when we're looking at whether coffee is good or bad for you, what are, what are the genetics behind it? And so those that do have a higher risk when it comes to heart health are not sort of one out of 10 people or something rare. It's actually 50% of the population. Uh, so that is very significant. Yeah, I mean, that's a big number. And again, being downtown here, working in a clinic with a lot of uh, female and male clients, but a lot of male clients who are starting their day with a venti, which, you know, and now we're getting up to what, 600 milligrams, a couple of ventis in the morning, and you're suggesting that half of the population are going to be reacting to more than two cups. So, I mean, um, get people that are medicated for blood pressure or, or, or heart disease risk. It's, uh, you know, we're sort of missing some of the low hanging fruit, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I agree uh, for sure. And, and then we have shift workers, we have truck drivers, we have uh, a lot of people working uh, long hours, whether it's in uh, you're in IT or software development or, you know, these these uh, uh, people working 12, 14 hours a day are just at their computer for various reasons. And I find a, a lot of people are consuming four, five, six or more cups a day. And it, it is uh, potentially a, a very big risk. And I think it's a, it's important that you. Um, you know, that, that we understand this information because we, we also don't want to put the message out there that nobody should drink coffee. And I know a lot of the natural health movement um, tries to get people to stop drinking coffee as if caffeine is, is this uh, overall toxin. Uh, but that's not the case. We, we do get some health benefits, but I think what's important is uh, moderation and also uh, knowing, of course, your, your genetic risk. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's all about the dose, isn't it? Regardless of whether we're talking exercise, nutrition. Now, now on yeah. that note, I mean, in terms of, you know, I've heard things set out there in terms of fast metabolizers, a certain percentage of the population. Are, are there general numbers of slow and fast metabolizers or how does that shake out in the genes? It's, it's 50-50. Gotcha. So, so um, well, it, it gets a little bit, so sort of to back up uh, again about the, uh, the genetics, um, so, for example, when we're analyzing DNA, we know that uh, if we remember from high school uh, biology, that DNA is a double helix. And so you have your, your two proteins that pair on this ladder, and they're always um, C's and G's, which stand for the cytosine and guanine, or they're the A's and T's, which are the, your uh, adenine and, um, oh dear, uh, <laughs> it's the T nucleotide. <laughs> thymine. Yep. And uh, so those are always paired together. Now, when you have a genetic variation uh, uh, on a certain part of your gene, one of these letters can change. And so perhaps uh, a C is going to replace an A. And so because you inherit one of these proteins each from, from your mom and from your dad, you can end up with a combination of sort of the original C and C, or you could get a C from mom and A from dad, or you could get an A from mom and an A from dad. So that would be uh, C, 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 A, or A, A, as far as these protein pairs. And these three combinations can result in different responses to foods, nutrients, supplements, beverages, and uh, other food bioactives that we consume. And uh, so this is the whole framework and concept of, of nutrigenomics is that these genetic variations affect our response to nutrients. And if we can identify these genetic variations, we can help determine uh, individual nutritional requirements and also uh, detect uh, food intolerances and cravings and dietary patterns that are gonna help us achieve an optimal body composition, uh, optimal health, and then again, sort of translating this into um, athletic performance. Perfect segue. I mean, in terms of performance, people are um, obviously coffee and, and pre-workouts and things are just massively popular um, and, 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 you know, the bulk mm -hmm. of evidence and then the, and the research in terms of the effectiveness. But in terms of this slow versus quick metabolizer, what are we seeing in athletes? Because we have we most general athletes send out this idea that caffeine's always going to be good for everyone. Now, you know, is that mm -hmm. the case or can you tell us a little bit about your research there? Sure. Yeah. And sorry to back up, I didn't quite answer your last question. Uh, so as far as um, uh, determining fast and slow metabolism, remember I said there's sort of three combinations of pairs? Well, sometimes we can see that two of those pairs will uh, have the same uh, phenotype. And phenotype is something that we can measure, that we can see. So we see that two of those uh, letter pairs, or we call them genotypes, uh, actually result in slow metaz metabolism of caffeine. And then um, the one uh, fast metabolizers, which is 50% of the population, uh, results in, in um, uh, the fast metabolism uh, of caffeine. So, um, but what's interesting is that in my research, I found that we had 50% of my population was a fast metabolizer. Then about 40% were moderately slow metabolizers. So again, that's one of those three pairs. Mm -hmm. And then I found that 10%, or it was actually about 8%, were uh, ultra slow metabolizers. So even though uh, the rest of the research that's related to uh, kidney function or glucose tolerance or heart attack risk, they tended to combine the two genotypes and classify them as slow metabolizers. But I found a difference in the slow and the ultra slow as far as performance. So just to back up to tell you a, a little bit about my study, yep. uh, I recruited over a hundred athletes. Uh, these were all male athletes because uh, um, the oral contraceptive uh, complicates things when we do caffeine and exercise research yep. as well as the time of the month for females. And uh, so these were multi-sport athletes. So I had uh, from boxers to rugby players to cross-country skiers to marathoners to power lifters, you know, the whole gamut. And uh, so I had them come into the lab and uh, day one, do their baseline data and do a VO2 max test for aerobic capacity. And then on visits two, three, and four, they were randomized to uh, 
to ingest either placebo or a moderate dose of caffeine, which was two milligrams per kilogram of body weight, or a higher dose, which was four milligrams. Now, these are both those doses are moderately low compared to a lot of the research we see is, is six milligrams per kilogram. That's unnecessary, it's too high, and the research is really shifting that really nobody needs more than four or five milligrams. Because that so, used to be the red line was the six, right? It, but you're saying now we're even bringing it down because that's, uh, yeah, that's just too high. Exactly. And we really are not seeing any difference between four or six milligrams per kilogram. So nobody needs to be doing these higher doses. And and this is an important concept in uh, training and working with athletes because we have the, the sleep issues that come up. And then we have people, uh, athletes training at night that are trying to get to sleep and they're taking over the counter sleep aids or perhaps pres prescription sleep aids. Absolutely. And we have this cycle that can be very harmful. And so we want to see what is the lowest effective dose that we can use that is going to have, that's going to mitigate, mitigate uh, these sleep issues um, and, and also uh, lower the risk to your heart health if, if you may have that genetic predisposition yeah so yeah so back to the uh, research so what uh, what I did is I looked at four different parameters of exercise performance power strength anaerobic capacity and aerobic capacity so the analyses I've most recently done looked at a 10 kilometer time trial which was the aerobic capacity and I found that the fast metabolizers which was 50% of my athletes had a, a very clear response uh, to caffeine where they were much faster uh, by about 1.2 minutes in a, a 19 minute time trial. So the average time uh, for the 10 kilometers, 18 to 19 minutes. So 1.2 minutes is, is huge. That's, That's a lot, yeah, wow. Six or 7%. And then the moderately slow metabolizers, which was about uh, a, a little over 40% of, of um, or 43% of the uh, population, they had uh, a non, they had a slight benefit, but it wasn't significant. So they're really not responding very well to the caffeine. And then what's interesting, even though I only had 8% of my subjects as ultra slow metabolizers, they actually did worse on caffeine. So when we looked at that 10 kilometer time trial, they actually increased their time by 2.5 minutes when they took caffeine. Wow. And that's huge. I mean, they did, you know, over 10% worse when they when they took caffeine compared to when they did this same time trial on placebo. And what was and the timing again? Sorry, Nancy. How long before the, the run were they doing that? The caffeine uh, dose? Taking the caffeine? Yeah. Yeah, 60 minutes. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So uh, so we did um, a few exercises, a few other tests before the, the time trial. So the time trial was the fourth exercise test. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so everyone was at about... Um, at about between 60 and 90 minutes. Okay. Um, and so this is where we see that caffeine is definitely in the body. It's definitely having an effect. Um, and uh, yeah, and then so uh, so basically caffeine reaches sort of its peak uh, blood level values between 45 and 90 minutes. But people do start feeling the effects of caffeine usually after about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And if you're ever having a conversation with someone after they've had a coffee, it's sort of at that 15, 20 minutes where people get really chatty and that's sort of the caffeine kicking in. Perfect. Um, so or like me, I'm just, you know, chatty right off the bat. So Awesome. Even extra bonus from that. That's a good uh, conference tip for people, you know, get someone drinking the coffee and just hang out with them and get to that 15 minute mark and all of a sudden the chats yeah. will be flowing. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so this is the implications of this research is that... Um, you know, by and large, we not only want to individualize and customize our diets for athletes to improve their performance, but we certainly want to be cautious with supplements. And so with all the ergogenic aids out there, or the performance enhancers, we want to be careful. Does this athlete really need it? Is it safe? Is it going to be effective? And because we see the research is reported in means, we don't see individual raw data. Uh, we don't really know what athlete did worse, what athlete did better. We just see the average response of a study that, let's say, looked at 50 athletes. On average, they improved when they took creatine or beta alanine or caffeine. But we don't know. Some of those athletes might have done worse. And so we really need to look in the devil's in the details in this research where we want to see the individual data and genetics is who the individual is. 
And so if we can start customizing our supplement regimes, this is, uh, of course, obviously going to be a, a benefit to the athletes um, for health uh, as well as uh, for their performance in the long run. And so I think that's really the future uh, of nutrigenomics and being able to customize is uh, also customizing the, those supplements. And you know what? Don't take it if you don't need it. We, you know, we want to minimize that. Absolutely. I've got so many, uh, so many questions here that I want to fire at you. Now, in terms sure. of your research, you had the, the power and the strength athletes. Now, I know traditionally um, we, you know, it's been shown that caffeine's more supportive of work capacity and not so much that one rep max um, type efforts. So in your data and your in your study there in terms of power and strength, what did uh, what were the findings? Uh, well, I actually have not looked at the power and strength yet. Uh, so that's that'll be coming out in the next few months. I'm just sort of focusing on the endurance aspect because that's where the the body of the literature uh, looks positive, where we see that in endurance athletes, that's where caffeine seems to be most effective. And uh, so even though I had power athletes, I still put them through these endurance tests. And remember that they were all testing against themselves. So we controlled for all the individual characteristics because each athlete took all three uh, doses, either zero, two, or four milligrams, and they competed against themselves. And so that we, you know, I, I'm going to, um, uh, so we can say that the, the caffeine uh, was a benefit no matter what type you of athlete you were as far as endurance. So my cyclists did better, my, my boxers did better, uh, you know, my rugby players did better when they were a fast metabolizer, no matter what their sport background. Gotcha. That's really interesting. And I love, I love the little teaser there. That's great as well. We're going to keep everyone on the edge of their seats for another few months and we'll get you back uh, yeah. to talk about the strength and the power. Now, a few questions that I know people tend to ask around, like habituation is, is a major one. If an athlete is used to drinking three or four cups a day, are they still getting that performance benefit? Are they better off to taper off before competition and then add it back in? What are your thoughts there? Well, I don't think we know conclusively. I can say, uh, because I've been writing up my literature review um, for my manuscripts and for my thesis, uh, there are uh, four uh, studies out there that, that did look at habituation, did not find an association, uh, You know, whether an athlete was consuming caffeine or coffee daily or not, they still seem to get uh, the performance enhancement or they didn't, so gotcha. it didn't yeah. matter. And okay. then um, as far as my research, I did not see an association. And now, you know, this is more than 100 athletes, and I didn't see that their habituation uh, affected uh, the outcomes. I know there was a recent study published last year that did find this, mm -hmm. um, and I believe there's one other. So, you know, the bulk of the evidence shows that habituation, uh, it, you know, doesn't seem to play a role. But again, I bring this back to genetics because we know that people also self-regulate their caffeine caffeine intake uh, and due to the, the way they feel uh, on caffeine, whether it's anxiety or feeling jittery or if they have serious withdrawal effects. So we know, we've identified the genes that show how serious your withdrawal will be. So that wow. plays a role in habituation. So if you can skip drinking coffee for three days and be just fine, um, that might be your lifestyle. Someday you're just like, oh, I didn't have coffee today. Other people that have severe withdrawal, they know when, when they their morning coffee is an hour late because they start getting a headache. And some people uh, actually really can't get over that withdrawal effect um, for a few weeks. And, um, you know, even even evidence of up to six months to completely clear yourself uh, of all withdrawal effects. And do you see, I mean, in certain people with uh, with those withdrawal effects, I mean, oftentimes I'll notice in clinical practice anyway, the ones who are consuming, you know, greater amounts of caffeine or greater amounts for them will tend to, if we do take caffeine away for, let's say, a week or whatnot, um, they might get more significant symptoms, but they tend to, once they get out of that, um, you know, they sort of come out of the of the dark tunnel there. They, they tend to feel a little bit better. They, they The, the energy is a little bit better upon waking. Like it, you mentioned yeah. there's a gene for that now that we can kind of test for. Is that anecdotally accurate with what you're seeing in the, in the lab? Yeah, well, I, I think what they've done is... Um, uh, identified that as far as doing questionnaires of people's withdrawal effects um, and, and then looking at their genetics behind it. And they see that there's a relationship. Uh, so we don't know, um, because there there are a lot of effects of caffeine and there are 
a lot of genetics. I mean, right now we know that there's 20 genes that are uh, involved in your response and metabolism uh, of caffeine. Uh, so, so as far as um, you know, some of these have been investigated further than others. Um, it, but I think right now it is sort of anecdotal um, that some people do feel better, you know, after a couple of weeks off of caffeine, that, you know, they, but I think it can also be psychological. They feel that they, they accomplished something. They got rid of sort of this addiction that was in their, in their, in their diet. But For I sure. think, um, I think perhaps, uh, you feel better because you don't start feeling that withdrawal that can happen maybe 24 hours uh, later the next morning where you wake up and you don't feel good because you you do have that that dependency that you haven't met yet by having your morning cup of java <laughs> for um, sure for so, sure yeah. now some other popular ones that i wanted to uh, you know we've seen recently in the literature we you know, usually, typically, anhydrous caffeine was the the, the choice uh, for performance benefits. I've seen some s studies coming out. Uh, Jose Antonio there at ISSN had uh, put one out there on Twitter about you know just regular coffee being just as good as anhydrous caffeine. Can you uh, share your thoughts with that and or what you yeah. see in the research? Yeah. No, that there there are a few studies, and uh, Asker Zhukandru, uh, he he's uh, done a lot of caffeine research, and uh, he found that uh, as well. Um, the complication with that, uh, it is important to try and standardize how much caffeine is in the coffee. Uh, so they did that by using, uh, I believe, instant coffee, and they were able to standardize the dose that was in that brewed coffee and make it comparable to the anhydrous or, or the, the powder uh, form, which we also, of course, standardize. But when you look at your performance in the gym or if you're going for a run and you decide, okay, this morning uh, you're going to get your tall uh, Starbucks or second cup or wherever you go and, and you have a great run, three days later you go back to the same coffee shop, you get your tall coffee and you go uh, for a run and, you know, that you're there, there's, you know, no comparison. You, you had uh, a very poor run and the, the caffeine didn't seem to do anything. Um, that could be due to the variation uh, day to day, even at the same coffee place in those coffee beans. So we know that there can be up to um, oh, like 50 to 100 milligram difference. Wow. Uh, in just, yeah, so that's a lot. So, yeah, so sometimes definitely. You, yeah, you can be getting almost double the caffeine um, in your same tall size Starbucks uh, day to day. And so that's that's really important uh, for people to understand because in research, we don't do that. We wouldn't just be brewing coffee or getting it, you know, take out from Tim Hortons and giving it to our subjects. Um, so when, when we look at the standardized research, yes, coffee, uh, when standardized for the amount of caffeine is the same as powder form caffeine. But if you're out there in the real world, uh, you know sometimes you get more of a kick out of your coffee, and that's because there was a difference in the content. So I, you know, my, what I'm hearing there is maybe for more of our elite or obviously professional or elite level athletes, I mean, standardizing supplementation is likely going to be your best bet to really know exactly what dose you're giving your athlete versus maybe your your weekend warrior, your client who's just happy to have their cup of coffee and go out and train. Maybe it's uh, you know yeah. they, they might be all right with a little bit of a variance. Absolutely. Yep. I fully agree. And the higher the level of the athlete, the more precise we have to be, uh, as you know, with their diet. Uh, we don't just say percentage of protein. We go by grams per kilogram. Uh, when we're talking supplements, we want a very specific dose because we want to make sure, especially under uh, a competition scenario, we want to make sure that they're having that exact same performance benefit. And we don't want to to stray away from what we've seen in practice. So we don't want to be messing around with dosages uh, when it comes to a, a, a competition. So it's important in practice to see how you respond. And of course, we want to replicate the best practice scenarios uh, into that competition arena. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, if we shift over to uh, timing of the day, so in terms of we talked a little bit about sleep, but we've got athletes now, you know, you have your three o'clock coffee because you're a little bit run down and now the athlete has their pre-workout, which oftentimes they're not even sure how much caffeine is in there anywhere from 150 to 250, maybe 300 milligrams, you know, in the afternoon. How is that impacting sleep? And are you a fan of, you know, afternoon ergogenics like that? 
Well, <laughs> that that's a complicated uh, question. For sure. It's a, it's a loaded yeah. question, but uh, give yeah. us your best shot. Well, um, well, again, it comes back to how quickly is caffeine uh, leaving your brain and how quickly can you get to sleep? And so, um, of course, we all know people that say, geez, if I have you know, caffeine past noon, I can't sleep at 10 o'clock that night. And then, as you mentioned earlier, we have some people that can have an espresso after dinner and, and fall asleep. Uh, so I think it depends on your individual response. And usually people know uh, whether they can sleep or not. And it only takes a few times of, of testing it out to know when, you know, what what is your, uh, you know, what, what's your threshold and what's your timeline, um, you know, before you want to go to bed. Uh, so, but I do... As I mentioned earlier, I do think we need to be careful with athletes that are training later in the day or the general public. If you are using caffeine to, to pep up your workout, um, there is a bit of a, a cost uh, that you, you have that risk of not being able to sleep. And we know that sleep is, is very important for recovery um, and next day performance, whether it's another training session or competition. And uh, I also do get worried about the overuse of sleep aids, you know, whether it's melatonin or nitol or gravel or, you know, people using various substances or it's prescription. Um, we really want to keep the body clean. And with our young athletes, you know, the cleaner, the better. And I would rather put less into their body. Uh, so that's, again, why we want to look at the lowest doses possible. So uh, we see responses of, of some Athletes, um, no matter what their body weight, just having a hundred milligrams towards, you know, mid or the the end of training, we see that caffeine seems to also have a quite a robust effect when you start feeling tired. And so some of those sessions where fatigue is a factor, you know, over a, a longer training session, uh, maybe halfway through your session, um, you know, have a whatever is convenient. We know marathoners and uh, triathletes use flat coke. They're getting a bit of the sugar, but there was a very interesting research um, that the research came after the athlete's behavior where we saw all these athletes using uh, flat Coke, which was supplying about 100 milligrams of caffeine uh, towards the end of their race. And that really gave them a pickup in the last sort of 30 to 60 minutes. And then they, they went back to the lab and decided to test this uh, in two studies. I believe it was Burke and colleagues in, the U in Australia. And uh, sure enough, uh, that was very effective. So not consuming caffeine beforehand, but just as a pick-me-up when you start feeling tired. And, and if we can keep those doses low, then we're not going to have such a, a dramatic uh, negative effect to, to sleep in those that are vulnerable. I think that's great advice. I mean, I definitely, I've seen sort of an alarming trend of younger athletes being told to take melatonin, you know, 16, 18, 20-year-olds as a sleep aid. And you think, wait a minute, we're missing the you know, we're sort of treating the smoke here. What's the cause of the fact that they're having trouble falling asleep or staying asleep? And things like yeah. caffeine and, of course, being on Twitter or Instagram all night long are definitely yeah. – there's definitely some easy wins to address uh, address first, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, As you know, yeah, sleep, uh, sleep is huge in the research right now. And it's actually amazing what's happening during sleep. And, and so really you have to weigh the cost-benefit analysis. And really is that that perk you're getting in your, your – your training session from the caffeine, is it worth it when you have a very disrupted sleep, um, you know, coming that night? And, and certainly if that's your habit day after day, um, you know, that's an issue. Maybe save your caffeine for when um, it is a longer training session or you feel tired, you feel like you're not going to be able to, to have the same uh, high intensity performance. Um, so, so use it moderately and, and be, uh, sort of smart about when you use it and maybe just save it for competition. You know, there's talk to, talk to your sport dietitian about, it, or your coach or your, um, you know, your other healthcare professional and, and what right, what works right for that individual. And again, I bring it back to the individual because we can't be giving blanket guidelines because everyone, you know, has, has, um, their unique needs. Terrific. Well, can you give us uh, a few more insights then, uh, Nancy, in terms of, uh, you know, someone getting their, their genetic testing done, especially on a sport level, what are some of the findings that they might uh, take home from uh, a test like that? Yeah, well, it, one thing uh, now that um, 
we've sort of progressed in the field of nutrigenomics. You don't need a blood sample. It's a simple saliva test. You just need about a quarter teaspoon of saliva. And uh, there are many markers that, that we're looking at. And so, uh, for example, your ability to recycle vitamin C or your ability to convert vitamin D into its active form uh, or your ability to um, convert beta carotene into vitamin A or uh, your absorption of folate or B12, uh, as well as your response to uh, protein and fat and carbs in your diet and how that relates to body composition. So as far as health goes, you have to be healthy before you can perform at your best. Whether you're an athlete or you're a busy mom, uh, everybody, uh, of course, needs to be healthy uh, to perform in life. So athletes, first of all, need to be healthy. And so we, we need to make sure that they're meeting their individual nutrient requirements, as well as seeing their response, whether it's caffeine or whether it's their response to saturated fats or refined carbohydrates, we can better design diets that are going to suit that individual. And as far as body composition knows, uh, it's not just for how you look uh, in the athletic world. Uh, it's it's a it's very correlated, highly correlated with your performance and sort of your power to weight ratio or your strength to weight ra ratio. Um, and then we have, of course, our aesthetic sports. Uh, so I think um, what I've experienced is a lot of athletes that are sort of, uh, you know, falling victim to some of these diets or some of these uh, uh, sort of evil macronutrients that they're trying to expel from their diet. And you know, such as carbohydrates. And athletes generally need carbohydrates, depending on your sport and the intensity of your sport. Um, I think, um, you know, we do want to see that if an athlete is sensitive to carbohydrates, perhaps we lower that or we periodize the carbohydrates to make it lower outside of training, but make sure we fuel that training. Whereas we see that some other athletes are at high risk of the uh, of fat gain if they're consuming a high fat diet. So it really brings it back to the individual. And we see this, uh, of course, it's January. We see it all over the place. People die. Absolutely. Not yeah. Everybody responds the same way. So now, you know, we're unraveling the genetic con component that can help us determine what's the appropriate diet for you as far as health, as far as body composition, as far as performance. And, you know, so, so I think um, that's really the future. And, you know, certainly uh, when it comes to sport uh, genomics or exercise physiology, we're not quite there yet, but that's what we see in the future. We're gonna look at someone's genetics and, and we're gonna be able to, to uh, uh, guide and customize the way they train. That's about five years away, and I just want to put that out there because I don't want to conflate nutrigenomics with sport or exercise physiology genomics uh, because I think uh, one is trying to determine talent talent, uh, or, or predict how you should train, whereas what we're doing is we're looking at modifier genes, generally those that are modifying enzymes in the body and making you respond differently to nutrition, which is a very... Uh, strong science built on a, a strong foundation, whereas we have a, a lot of a, a long ways to go when it comes to how to train people. That's terrific. I mean, I, I love that uh, you know using things as tools. That idea of even nutritional periodization, which is you know for some reason you know obviously not controversial, but seemingly to some in terms of this low carb versus high carb, rather than just figuring out the dose that we need for the, the given, um, exercise bout or, or person's the goals, right? Hand. The task at hand. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. now you'd mentioned before, like the, is it the Amy one gene there? The, the number of copies impacting yes. the starch. Can you walk us through just briefly? Cause I think uh, obviously with carbohydrate intake being such a hot topic, I think people will be, uh, interested in that. Sure. Yeah, so uh, the AB1 gene is sort of determining um, your blood glucose and insulin response uh, when you consume starch. And we see that some people are uh, starting genetically. We see that they start uh, um, metabolizing or breaking down starch in the mouth through their release of salivary amylase. And those that are not releasing that due to the, the function of the gene that determines that, that release of the, in your saliva, uh, that those that aren't pre-digesting uh, do seem to have a, a higher 
uh, blood glucose spike after consuming starch. And this has been associated with metabolic syndrome, so sort of the, the visceral fat and the, the blood pressure and the prediabetes, um, and also the propensity uh, to, to gain fat in general. And so uh, an individual who's looking for leanness um, might want to know what, what their genetics are uh, as far as that goes and, and modify their intake of starch and, uh, you know, use, design their diet carefully uh, around starch and, and other uh, perhaps high glycemic index carbohydrates. You know, there's a, there's a few genes we look at that are uh, associated with the metabolism of carbohydrates. I think that's really important because, you know, a lot of people will get benefit, especially in the short term, if they're overweight or trying to lose weight or, or have, you know, dysglycemia or, or high insulin levels from reducing carbohydrate. But oftentimes for certain people we can see in the long run, they, they stop getting that benefit or they rebound. So this can provide some nice uh, framework to really, like you mentioned, kind of personalize and figure out what the real right dose is for them in the long run, right? Yeah, I agree. That, uh, that's why I signed up for this four years ago. Awesome. Um, you know, awesome. to go back to school and do my PhD, I thought, wow, this is really cutting edge stuff. And this is really uh, the future of nutrition, whether it's for health and wellness or for sport performance. Uh, we need to individualize. And a lot of the, uh, you know, s some large organizations are, are recognizing that and saying, hey, you know, we have to see what's right for the individual. You know, whether it's supplements, medications, therapies, uh, not everything works the same across the population and we need to find out what works best for you that's terrific now i think the question everybody wants to know nancy is how do you take your coffee after all this discussion we had a little <laughs> brief uh <laughs> this is the, the hot the hot question here i have an americano sort of once a day i will tell you i've been busier than normal in the past year and it's sort of two a day is snuck in there and i definitely feel it especially if i have that later in the day um so that's kind of my my caffeine black americano how do you right. take your coffee well, <laughs> should I get my it, pen it, out here and take notes? <laughs> it, yeah, it is a little bit complicated. What I, I like to uh, sort of accomplish two things at once. So nice. it tends to be my my breakfast as well. So I do uh, get a misto, which is a, a light blend. I, I am a Starbucks fan. Nice. So I get a venti misto with uh, three quarters lactose free, one quarter soy, uh, no foam and cinnamon after the coffee before the milk. And so that gives me a good dose of protein uh, to start my day uh, while I'm walking my dog uh, at about, uh, I think about 15, 16 grams of protein. Awesome. And uh, of course I'm getting my caffeine kick. And of course I keep the baristas uh, busy with that complicated drink. <laughs> And you've got your dialed in barista, right? Because that sounds like uh, once they've got that one nailed, you probably want to go back to the same barista yeah, over and over, I right? Yeah, I do. There's two different awesome. uh, locations that, that I frequent and, and they know me. They start making my drink when I walk out the door, which is nice. And Fabulous. So, yeah. Fabulous. Well, this is so much fantastic information. Um, I'd love to dive into even more of the things that are coming out uh, from your lab in, in the new year. But uh, until then, where can people get in touch with you uh, on the internet, uh, Twitter, that type of thing? Sure. Yeah, uh, I am very active on Twitter. So I do tweet a lot about uh, sports nutrition, strength and conditioning, uh, genetics, nutrition. And uh, so that's at Nancy Guest RD. And Nancy is spelt with an I. And my website is also on my Twitter page, but that's uh, just nancyguest.com. Again, N A N C I at G U E S T. And uh, that's probably the best place. And, you know, I will say I, I would like to give my research gate. I am on there. But right now I, I'm just in the pro process of writing up three manuscripts. So I think this year I'm going to have three or four publications. But as of yet, everything is still unpublished. But I'm, I'm working on it. So that's fantastic.